Hi there, and welcome to this to Rethinking the Human Factor podcast with me, your host, Bruce Hallis. For those of you who are new to the podcast, let me just briefly explain what it is that we're up to here. Six years ago, I started conducting research into the challenge that we face within the information security industry, which has been labelled, rightly or wrongly, the human factor. Over that six-year period, I identified a wide range of disciplines which weren't traditionally disciplines or skill sets or experience that you saw within the information security industry. But based upon my research, there were great opportunities for us to improve the current way that we're approaching the challenge of uh, raising awareness, influencing behavior, and fostering an appropriate organizational culture where security was truly valued. Those disciplines I took away and identified a specialist who came from an academic or a practitioner background who I believe could provide insights to the community here at the Rethinking the Human Factor to help sort of nudge us along that path towards a more mature approach to the challenges that we face. Series one of the podcast is all about reaching out to those people and bringing them into the community and trying to create a debate or a discussion around the insights that they are bringing to us. I think the really important thing to get from all of these podcasts is that the challenges of awareness, behavior and culture are not unique to the information security industry. And really, we have an opportunity to engage with people outside of the security industry, often with very, very different skill sets and experiences to bring them in house and to focus them in a way to help us with the challenge of raising awareness of information security and influencing positive security behaviors whilst understanding and incorporating the cultural context that people are making choices within. So without any further ado, let's get on with the next interview. So hi everybody, um, welcome to this, the latest episode in the Rethinking Human Factor podcast with me, your host, Bruce Hallis. And as I promise every week, um, I am looking to bring to you something which I think is really, really interesting. Now, this lady is called Rachel Laws, and Rachel comes from a, a background which, I'll be completely honest with you about this, I'd never heard of the phrase semiotics. So uh, this is a, as much about me sort of getting to grips with things um, as it is about trying to introduce you to uh, a new specialist in a new area as far as information security professionals are concerned. And do you know what, I've read a white papers uh, we had a conversation beforehand and I was like, God, this really ties in with a lot of the work that I've been doing. And so I thought, we've got, we've got to ask Rachel to come on the show. And Rachel has agreed to come and share some insights with us. So, Rachel, great to have you on the show. Bruce, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I'm really, really looking forward to having this chat. I read the white papers and as I was reading through the, the, the oh. white papers and, and seeing the presentations, etc. I was like, how many notes do I need to make here? Uh, <laughs> this is going to take forever. This is going to take forever. I'm but it's, flattered that you. I'm flattered that you read all the stuff I sent you. <laughs> it, was, it was really, really good. It's just, you know, you can get given a lot of stuff to do. Yeah. But if you find something that's really interesting... I know. And I, and this is the thing that really, really, did, really blew me away is that, you know, when I think about what you're saying, and then I was thinking about the interviews we've done with, you know, the other, the other guests on the show, and I'm like, ah, oh, that makes, that, that joins up with that, mm. that joins up with that. And then you start, yes. to, and you start to see things from a different angle. And, and that's the whole thing we're trying to do with the podcast is, you know, rethink um, okay. by getting people like yourselves in to sort of mm. stir and create a different angle. So really chuffed that you could join us on the show. So do you want to just let us know a little bit about what semiotics is? Yeah, I can do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is great for a kind of cocktail party type of conversation. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I'll get the drinks so, out. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> so when people say, um, what is semiotics anyway? Then they, the sort of correct answer you can give them is that it is the study of signs and symbols. Okay. Okay. So for anybody who's living in any sort of, you know, environment that's been built up by human civilization in any way. So in other words, if you don't live on, in a cave or on a desert island, mm -hmm. then you're surrounded by things that humans have produced. And um, of course, in some parts of the world, you know, like I'm speaking to you from London and this whole city is full of signs and symbols, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's full of very specific pieces of architecture. It's also chock full of advertising. It's crowded with brands. People are walking around wearing fashions and particular hairstyles. Sometimes you can even detect what part of the city somebody is from, depending on what haircut they're wearing. 
So all of this stuff is are signs and symbols, and semiotics is the study of that and what do those things mean. Um, so that's the that's the kind of easy version, and it's the version when people know anything at all about semiotics, that's what they know. Right. Um, and then um, if you want to go slightly deeper into it, there's a kind of second half of semiotics that is less widely known about which is that we're not just decoding signs and symbols as some kind of train spotting activity just because we like being geeky. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing it because um, the point of it is to reveal something about how society works. And that's of huge interest to people like brand donors because they quickly realise, the first thing they realise is that they can use semiotics to sort of tweak their advertising and packaging and make people respond to it in the way that they want and then not too long after that they start to realize what it can really really do at a deeper level and they will start coming to me saying things like we need to understand this particular demographic of consumers better or they'll say things like well we've got this brand that sells really well in North America, but we can't shift it in Western Europe and we think there might be something cultural going on. So that's essentially what semiotics involves and that's what I do. Okay, so it's a game of two halves. Yes, indeed. Right, okay, I thought I'd just get a football pun in there. So the first, <laughs> the, the, the first part of the pun, the first half of the game is really signs and symbols. Yes, what do they mean? So if your brand logo is red or blue, what difference does that make, for example? Yeah, and that's really important, the, the difference in colours, actually, and the impact that has upon the choices people make is is a really interesting piece of research. Mm. People don't anticipate that it's going to have a big impact, but it does, and it, mm. it does in different cultures, et cetera. So there's, yeah. there's the symbols piece. And then the second half is really mm -hmm. about understanding how society works yeah. to better inform the way that for example the example you gave was you know to better inform how you tweak an um, an advertising campaign or some sort of marketing mm -hmm. campaign correct me if i'm wrong here to better increase the likelihood that somebody's going to actually choose that brand over yeah, other brands that's exactly right so although i do some work um in the, the public sector and in education most of the work that i do is with um consumer facing brands and this could be things like food alcohol retail banking you know that type of thing right um, pharmaceuticals in various different places okay and what what these what those brand owners have in common when they come to me is that they want to change behavior okay so then what they essentially want to do is they want people to start buying more of buying their brands they want them to buy in larger quantities they want them to upgrade to the more premium version within their range they want them to switch to their brand from somebody else's brand, that type of stuff. So essentially, it's all about behaviour change. And at first, the first, initially, they come to me and say, can you help us develop new packaging or tweak our advertising so that it will influence people's behaviour more effectively? And then when they start to get a knack for semiotics, then they will come and say, we need to understand what's motivating this entire group of consumers. So I did a really interesting piece of work one time in um, the United States that was about the um, Hispanic population mm -hmm. um, who are relatively, especially especially men, are relatively reluctant to go and consult the doctor about health problems. Mm -hmm. And that means it's difficult to catch them, catch things like diabetes at an early stage. Okay. okay. Um, so you can use semiotics to answer those kind of big questions as well, like what is it exactly that Hispanic people don't like about going to the doctor and how do we solve that? So what I mean, and that's quite a big question, and goes a bit deeper than just uh, how should we, what should we, should we make our, you know, what colours should we deck out our brand in, or what language should we use in our advertising? Hmm. Yeah, so it goes deeper, but it's almost like I'm a big fan of marginal gains, and so like mm. you can you can tweak the colour, you can tweak the font, you can tweak, you know the content message it to mm. a certain degree as well and then you start getting into the deeper stuff yeah. you saw these really small improvements that when you bring them all together are like ah yes. this enables us to break through and, and to change that direction in terms of behavior and you know it's enormously powerful you know for, for so when, when i work with a brand owner over a period of time and they become more experienced and more skilled in doing this kind of work with me once you've got that complete suite of roots to insight in your hands that's an incredibly powerful position to be in that's a really powerful and very desirable situation and that is why semiotics has gone from being pretty unheard of 20 years ago when i first came on the scene to now something that is quite mainstream and quite well known in in marketing circles although it's still emerging but you know we're, we're a long way forward from where we were 20 years ago
Okay, okay. So I'm now going to whirl us back to a comment you made, which I'm not sure if the listeners would have picked up upon, but I just picked it up like that. I was like, that that's really interesting. So you mentioned that how a majority of your work is uh, f- uh, supporting organizations that are doing, you know, business to consumer, got a mm. product or a service to sell to, to, mm. to consumers. But you did highlight there that you've got a s- relatively small number of clients who are more education, more government mm. type base. And so what I wanted sort of, because this is a challenge many people sort of put my way, is they turn around and go, well, you know, does, does business to consumer, do, do the insights we apply to the business to consumer situation mm. are they also you know are they applicable when you're looking at you know it's not my consumer but for example it's about trying to affect policy yeah and that policy could be like at a government level policy across the whole of our country it could be um, policy in the sense of you know organizational policy here we mm. go it's a policy much like mm. you have a national policy do you know what we want people to comply with that policy so i'm just right. trying to think do you think there is a because you still you, you drew a line hmm. do you think those insights can be applied to both sides of the fence so to speak both external market and internal market yeah definitely because it's about it's about behavior change isn't it it's about as you say you want people to comply and um that's that's the 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 common thread that run, runs through all of the work that i do mm-hmm. so I, I could think of you know a couple of examples that are perhaps a bit bit closer to your the industry that your your listeners are in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, for example, um, I did a bunch of work for um, Ofgem, the, which regulates the behaviour of energy suppliers. Okay. And as a matter of fact, they published a review that I wrote, which is um, available on the internet. Um, so, if people wanted to Google me and Ofgem, they'll find they'll be able to find that review. Okay. So, essentially, the problem that Ofgem were having was that. Uh, there, first of all, there are a lot of utility suppliers in the UK, all right, mm-hmm. um, and there is no um, standardised practice amongst these suppliers about uh, what kinds of words and phrases they use when they're describing their products and services and charging you for them. Right. Okay. Now, the law, there are laws in place that stipulate that um, energy uh, suppliers must just do certain things when they send you bills and statements. They're legally obliged to do certain things, like inform the customer that um, it's their right to change supplier and how to do that and who you should get in touch with if you've got a complaint. And they're also obliged to provide um, some sort of a cost breakdown so that you can see what you're spending. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, so the situation was that all these, these proliferation of energy suppliers were complying with the... Um, with the letter of the law, but not really the spirit. Uh-huh. <laughs> so the, the, the information was all there, <laughs> but it was it was quite a lot of it was in small prints and you know tucked away in, in at sort of at the end of the back page and that kind of stuff. But even legalese. more interestingly, some, yeah, there was an element of legalese, and there was almost a, there was a quite an interesting demonstration of how you can put up a wall between you and your customer using language. So it was it was some of the language was needlessly formal and a bit middle class and um, how shall I put it? Te- just a bit excessively technical and distant and a bit cold and not very similar to how people actually talk when they're talking about household bills. Mm. And so, you know, if you want people to fail to realise that they're entitled to change their supplier and you want them to not quite understand what they should do if they've got a complaint, that would be a terrific way of going about it. <laughs> ah, so-, so what I did was to, I conducted a detailed survey of energy bills and statements from a huge number of suppliers in the UK and um, we looked at what some of these common practices were and then how to resolve them and I often found that really useful and because you 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 say it's a thing that can work both ways you know if you can identify how to sort of keep people at bay and prevent them from understanding what's going on using language then the the flip side of that coin is that you can you've also got some things in place that will help make it much easier and this was was similar to a kind of another project that i worked on which was actually it was private sector but it was a catalog company who wanted to um alter the way that their local agents handled their sales paperwork right so there'd been a change in the law and this company needed their local agents who are kind of just like local people on the on the ground in communities taking orders for things like jumpers and shoes and things like that 
but often they've been doing it for years and they're very efficient at it. Yeah. Um, the law changed and those people needed to start processing their information in a different way and according to a different time frame. Okay. Mm. So the catalogue company needed to get that information out to them. Now the local agents, you know, are brilliant agents, but they're not always very fond of reading, you know, te boring technical letters yeah. from head office, you know what I mean? Mm. So the, the catalogue company had a interesting problem on its hands so they first of all get we needed to get people to open the envelope in the first place yeah then we needed to understand we needed them to understand what was required of them and how much time they'd got and thirdly we needed them to comply and this was i, did, I used kind of similar principles on this project that i did for off gem in the sense that i set out some kind of well-established well-researched rules for language use yeah that just said this is how you get closer to your to your person on the ground. If you speak to them like this, following these types of principles, then they will understand what you're saying and you've got a much better chance of them feeling like you're in this together and they actually want to comply. Yeah. So it's an element of uh, tone of voice, isn't it, really? Yeah. I mean... The tone of voice is a huge part of it. Yeah. And there are all sorts of like interesting kind of linguistic details, you know. Like when I say that, um, the energy suppliers were using a lot of quite sort of middle class and remote language. What I mean by that is that one common thing that middle class people really do a lot of is uh, they um, will they speak in sentences that have a lot of clauses like you and I are doing right now. <laughs> and, and those clauses are often connected with words that imply a causal relationship. Yeah. So they'll say things like therefore to connect two clauses together, you see yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas um, in more colloquial, everyday English, sentences are often shorter and clauses are more likely to be joined together with words that simply connect, like so words like and, as opposed to therefore, do you see what I mean? I get that because I was having a conversation with somebody and I actually sometimes start my sentences with and, Right. When I'm writing them out. Um, yes. And some of the people go, you write as you speak sometimes. Mm. And I said, yeah, I know, I know. I said, but the funny thing is, my teacher taught me never to start my, my sentences with, mm. with and. But mm. actually, when, when I'm writing, it seems natural to say and yeah. this. So, mm. yeah, okay. Do you know what I think is fascinating is that one consequence of digital culture by which I mean not just the invention and penetration of the internet, but also the fact that, you know, people are on their mobile phones and on social media all the time and things like that, is that um, written language has taken on a life of its own in a way that we haven't really seen for a long time, not within our lifetimes. This is new, relatively new. Yeah. And um, so written language now, like if you think about the way that you communicate in writing, as you say, it doesn't, it no longer, written language is no longer required to really follow the rules of grammar that you and I were taught at school. And mm. um, what's much more important is being able to get your message across, right? Absolutely. And so this might involve substantial use of abbreviations, emojis, um, um, you know, it's no longer, you know how like if you receive a text message and there are capital letters and full stops in there, you can kind of guess the age of the person who sent it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's very true. <laughs> so I think written language, because people are more involved with written language than, they, than they, they have been historically for a long time, you know what I mean? We don't write by hand anymore, but people communicate using language and text now more than they have done for a long, long time. And I think that as a result of that, written language has taken on a real life of its own and is operating according to its own rules. And that as well is something that organisations might want to take an interest in. Yeah. If part of their job is getting people to change their behaviour using written messages. Really, really, really good point. In previous interviews with guests on the show, one of the key things to come across is that the challenge of here are the corporate guidelines. Mm, oh okay. God. And, yeah right yeah. you already don't want to read right i mean you're already kind of like oh god do i have to read this <laughs> yeah 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 but, but in a way it tells you what you don't want to be doing <laughs> you know, like, oh, that's what we don't want to be doing then okay fine at least we've got a sense of real direction but it is that thing about and I, I understand why people feel the need for corporate guidance and there is some yeah. value in corporate guidance but <laughs> yeah. it's about also recognizing hold on here um mm -hmm. I really want to engage with my audience. I really want well, them to also, open like, up. What do you want? Do you want to change people's behaviour? Because there is an element of meeting people halfway or even all the way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know? and, and the point you're making about 
you know, uh, there used to be a time where if you wanted to write anything down, you, you, you had to get your hands on a pen for a start and then yeah, find something. Right. And now you're like, no, I just do it on my phone. I communicate with anybody on my phone. So you yeah, communicate, right. people are communicating all the time, and especially certain demographics, it's a lot more all the time. And then they use a different language to what, the, in terms of what when they're using those devices mm. to what they might do when they're actually writing or even talking um, do you mind if i ask you something bruce yeah. when you're when you're typing a text message on your phone how do you do it are you using Badly. two thumbs or a finger or what are you doing <laughs> whatever's free at the time um, i think i i think i oh no i just tried it hold on yeah, I try using my thumbs, but it's not unusual for me just to use one finger because yeah. I, I hold the phone with one hand. I had the other, you know, finger yeah. for doing things. If I hold it with two, sometimes yeah. I, it just seems seems a weird thing to do. Okay. Why? Why are you? You're going to give us some insight. Why am I asking? Yeah. Because it's as much as all this business about linguistics is interesting. Um, how you how you physically manipulate your phone is also a semiotic sign. Okay. Wow. So okay. if you're imagine that you're sitting on a train on the London Underground, for example, and um, you've got your phone out and you want to type a message to your to your friends, if you can do this adeptly using two thumbs, then you've signalled yourself to other people on the train as I'm essentially young, and I've got the skills for coping with modern life you know I've, I've kind of i've got the necessary repertoire of skills for being a competent you know londoner in in 2018 yeah if you if you poke at your phone with one finger which i'm also guilty of doing myself <laughs> i saw donald trump being mocked just the other day for doing exactly that but he, somebody of course on camera stabbing at his phone with one finger trying to send a message and he was widely kind of mocked and it was like look this just proves what or not how old and out of touch he is you know oh. so like the way that you use your phone is not a neutral thing and especially if you just be careful okay if you're doing it in public <laughs> yeah yeah that, was looking at uh, that, that guy over there yeah yeah he acts as old as he looks. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, exactly. No one's going to believe that you're young and hip and trendy if you're if you're poking at your phone with one finger like you've never seen a phone before, you know. Uh, so maybe maybe want to practice at home, Bruce, when no one's looking. When well, nobody's pra looking. Practice with your thumbs until you get good at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as, as the host of the show, I think we'll move on from my age. <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. So let's move let's move on swiftly to. Uh, um, okay, so I, that was that was interesting. The off-journey example was interesting. It's interesting how you know in that case they were like, yes, we are compliant with the legislation. Yeah. But the but the, you're right. The principle behind it was to bring around changes in behaviour. So or to give. Mm -hmm. I think in that case it was to give people so they knew the options, which basically yeah. gave them a better uh, chance of choosing between them, which yeah. is which is interesting because we just we did the interview with Dan Arley and okay. he and he's behavioral economics and uh, you know he's very much about choice architecture designing yeah. the, the the choices and yeah. so off gym in a way we were, were, were sort of going through that process they were sort of yeah eroding choice by wrapping it in language and symbols which yeah. actually mystified people yeah. so that they didn't actually so, know so interesting there are so many ways to to make a message clear and so many ways to kind of obscure it and cover it up you know one of the things that i noticed so as i said one of the things that there's about these useless use suppliers is they're obliged to tell the customer about things like how to complain or you know how to about how to about their basically about their rights concerning leaving their leaving their supplier and switching to somebody else mm. and some of these energy suppliers were kind of they were, on the whole they avoided using the word rights and they preferred to um, use terms like advice so you can get advice from these organizations you know you can come to you can talk to us or you can talk to an ombudsman, you see what I mean? Yeah. But they would they would favour the word advice over rights, and there's a good reason for that, okay? Because if they semiotically, they're two completely different words. They might be close enough in meaning to kind of satisfy a lawyer, but but in if you look at it linguistically, they're two completely different things. So you know, as soon as you use the word rights with a member of the public, they'll immediately go on alert you know they're like oh this sounds important i know my rights <laughs> yeah, yeah i will not be swindled out of my rights you yeah. know and it immediately registers as something important and rights are something that should be defended as well you know mm -hmm. um and then but advice what's advice what's advice you know what i mean 
Oh, I didn't know what to do about my mother-in-law, so I wrote to the agony aunt at the Sun, <laughs> and she yeah. gave me some advice, right? So, you know, somebody else could advise you something which might or might not be correct. It might or might not be worth having. It might or might not be an expert who's giving it to you. You might or might not actually need it. It's a whole world of work and rights. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So when, you, when you've got that little bit on the end of your energy bill telling you, you know, blah, 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 you, you can get advice here. What they're really telling you is this, you've got to lose certain legal rights in the area of leaving your energy supply, but we don't really want you to know that. <laughs> So there you go. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot. The, the, the concept of advice. I didn't ask for the advice. Okay, yeah. right. I'm already turned off. Um, well, no, right, exactly. We have the idea of like there's such a thing as unwanted advice, isn't there? You're quite yeah. right. Is there such a thing as unwanted rights? No, there isn't. <laughs> no, no, that's rights right. Rights are by definition things that people want. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, I've just I've just pinged up that I've been completely framed and triggered there. Okay, right. All right. <laughs> so, okay. So this is a situation though, because the work that you do and semiotics is about is is partly you know going back to the opening part of the, of, of of our chat. You know, mm. it's sort of seeing what's going on in a given audience mm. and trying to understand what are the signs that they what is it they're giving off what are the signs that you mm. see in the audience which may be a reflection on how they would respond to you presenting something to them isn't yeah. it yeah 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 do you want to just flesh it out a little bit in the sense mm. of okay signs you, know, you mentioned brands mm. you mentioned you've given the example of how somebody uses the phone i'm really interested in the cultural piece as well use the example mm. of south america and their reluctance of of men mm. in particular to go and speak to dog do you can you just explain that a little bit more and especially the cultural context the fact that if i was trying to sell a product yeah across a range of different countries Hmm. Okay, how does semiotics help you engage more effectively and influence choices more effectively? Yeah, okay. This is a quite common question that, that people ask me. And so one of the common concerns of um, brand owners is that they might be operating in multiple countries. And so their, their question is, you know, how can we develop a brand or brand communications which are going to be effective all over the world? Um, and of course, that's quite a tall order because there's a lot of cultural variation around the world. Um, however, the good news, if we want to call it that, is that um, it's globalisation is a thing, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so for um, any community that can afford to participate in consumer culture, what I mean by that is people have got some disposable income. Yeah. Um, that, and that makes them interesting to brand owners. So um, anybody who can afford to spend on lifestyle stuff is um, to some extent part of a kind of global community of consumers and so there are certain rules which apply pretty much everywhere like for example the color red has a lot of meanings with some variation around the world but within its repertoire of meanings one that doesn't really change uh, is the idea that it communicates um, being the first or the original or the, the best or the primary example of something Okay. which is why it's a good choice for coca-cola it's also why as a matter of fact if you look at the um if i don't know if you ever look at things like lists of most most successful companies uh -huh. that, that are published from time to time if you look at their logos and their brand marks the most common colors are um, red blue and black you're not okay. going to see a lot of yellow purple green you're just not going to okay. red blue and black dominate the scene okay so there are some meanings of colors like this business about red signifying things which are first or primary or, or, or the original the important one the biggest one the first one on the list mm -hmm. that's pretty much universal there are also like for example gold communicates you know obviously kind of wealth and luxury and this too is almost universal mm -hmm. so that's the, that's the good news for kind of global messaging the bad news is, I guess, because it is because it because of its global reach, it is not very nuanced. Uh, it's not going to make anybody feel special. No one's going to look at this 
thing and think, oh, it, they've specially designed it for me, which is why Coca-Cola needed to um, release that range recently. Have you seen those bottles, Coke bottles with people's names on? Oh, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really nice. Huh? So they needed to do that because Coke is almost a victim of its own success. It's kind of so globally recognised that it's almost a bit, uh, it starts to lose its meaning because it's a bit generic. You see mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's that's the global situation. And then more specifically, sometimes at the other end of the scale of specificity, you've sometimes got very particular consumer groups or very particular regions of the world who are doing something interesting or presenting some kind of interesting problem for business. And then you can use semiotics to find out how to address them. So I was just earlier today in a meeting where I was talking about um, British men, young British men, and how the um, rules for being a British man have really changed dramatically over the last several years, Mm -hmm. um, especially with regard to the way that they're they're expected to look. So, you know, when, um, when I was growing up you know british men were had had a kind of diplomatic immunity from having to care about their appearance you know what i mean yes. yeah, yeah. you could tell you could have scruffy hair and you know you were expected to put on on loads of weight after you got married and had bad teeth and it was part of being british it was one of the benefits of being british you know that you didn't have to bother about this stuff um but then more recently you know i saw this shocking statistic which said that um rates of young british men being hospitalized with eating disorders had gone up 70 percent in six years Mm. Um, and there's a reason for that because now we, young British guys are subject. There's been a social change in this country, and there are um, standards and sort of ideals in place that say what you're supposed to look like if you're a young guy, you know, and you're supposed to have this this outrageous kind of musculature that is just not achievable without being in the gym all the time. Um, you need to have a tan, even though we don't get much sunshine. You must get uh, Maori tattoos all down one arm to sh- again to kind of show off your impressive muscle shape. Yeah. You know, you've got to have exactly the right haircut, and you've got to submit to this quite difficult regime. And um, your your performance will be continuously monitored because you've got to constantly take selfies for your Instagram accounts. Um, you know, you'll go on a kind of lads holiday once a year to Ibiza or whatever, and you'll be photographed by everybody there. So you, British men are very much on display now in a way that they haven't been historically and are, are really feeling the pinch. And so I was do, do, chatting with a client this morning about that and about how, because they're, they, they're interested in how they can target young British guys and get them to switch to, to a different alcohol brand. Right. And so, you know, we were discussing how in order to um, get them to, to switch to a different brand, you've really got to understand what kind of cultural influence is there. Yeah. being exposed to because they're not they've changed you know they're not what they used to be and it's, it's it's the situation here in the uk is somewhat specific to the uk and would be found in different you know kind of degrees or amounts in other countries so that's interesting that is, mm. that's interesting you know the culture the standards which are driving the change mm. that you were talking about that they've been prevalent for women for a long long no, time forever. You know, you and know, you know, forever. so long and it's not it's not that much fun i have to say constantly being sort of you know, because spending your whole life being shown pictures of bikini models and told that's what you're supposed to look like when realistically there's no hope for okay. me ever happening. Yeah. And, but and, having said that, I think women have had such a long history of that that we've developed a lot of coping mechanisms, okay? Like we're quite good at supporting each other and, you know, kind of yeah. agreeing amongst ourselves that this is just a hopeless fantasy. Whereas men, I think, don't have that historical, those historical coping methods are just not there. And that's why we've seen this sudden spike of men being hospitalised, you know, because they've just, they've got all these impossible standards that are expected to live up to and the coping mechanisms are not yet in place. I think, think, you know, think about things from a cultural perspective. It's quite interesting. It's the, you know, when you look at culture, I mean, we we were lucky to have Gertjan Hofsteed on Mm. and he's coming back. And so we've talked about culture to him with a certain degree. Yeah, and we've got a couple of other people lined up. And it seems when you start to really look at culture and understand how, you know, people tend to look at culture as like almost like an afterthought, but actually it, it's there. I mean, culture forms mm. everybody. There's no escape from it, you know. Have you been to the Andreas Gursky exhibition that's on like, the Hayward Gallery on the South Bank at the moment? No, I haven't, no. Okay, so uh, people, uh, listeners, if you haven't seen the Gersky exhibition, go and see it because it's amazing. Okay. Um, so Gersky, as we all know, is a German photographer, and he is um, famous for these huge photographs, like really large-scale photographs that are, are cleverly taken so that there's nothing which is out of focus. 
Um, so he'll take these enormous kind of landscapes where he's taken some really impressive photos of things like the um, stock exchange in Chicago, kind of big top-down views of huge hordes of people doing mm. their thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's his thing. He takes these gigantic photographs where you can see every detail, okay. Yeah. Uh, one of his most famous photographs, which is on um, exhibition in London right now, people can get to see it, is called 99 Cent. Okay. And it was taken um, in a uh, essentially a pound shop, a uh, dollar store. Okay. And the photograph is taken from the point of view of a security camera. So you feel like you're up on the ceiling looking down on this brightly lit store, watching people doing their shopping. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what we can see is that it's quite a striking photo for a number of reasons, partly because you wouldn't normally view a supermarket from that angle. Okay. Yeah. What we notice are certain things. Principally, I think the principal kind of for me, the principal take out of that photo is that these the is that there is no apparently there's no escape from the supermarket. There's no there's no visible exit. The aisles go on forever and have no end. Mm -hmm. There is no there are no windows, there's no natural daylight. Um, it's a completely um self-contained seals environment, quite a large one. And we're we're looking down upon all those rows of product brightly colored gaily wrapped highly processed food mm. and you can see a few people dotted about in the aisles thoughtfully exercising their right to choose and their free will okay and they're standing there in these in these aisles like almost like um like rats in a maze yeah and they're pondering which one shall i get you know uh, of this kind of between those two packets of highly processed, brightly coloured chemical goo, shall I get the red one or the blue one? Yeah. And um, the, it's the it's the almost the epitome of the kind of illusion of choice on the part of the consumer. So if, if you went up and asked them in a typical market research fashion and said, "What are you doing?" They go, oh, "Well, I don't, I'm deciding if I want blueberry or strawberry," you know. <laughs> and, the, and the illusion of, of of free will and choice is there. And what they can't see, and what we can see, thanks to Gursky taking this photograph from the vantage point of the ceiling, is that this this choice is illusory, and that they don't they're not free to choose something more consequential like getting out. There is no escape from the supermarket. That's essentially his message, I think. And so I think culture is like that. These people, although they don't know it and have no reason to contemplate the matter, are surrounded by some of the signs and symbols, and there's no way to get out of it. There's no way you can go on really on this earth anymore. <laughs> Maybe some remote parts of Antarctica or somewhere, but essentially there are not many places left on the planet that you can go to escape the supermarket. We're surrounded by culture and the products of culture all the time. That's really interesting. It's really beautifully put. I mean, it, it, when you when you're describing that. You know, people are, you know, the supermarket, it, it locks off the outside world to a certain yeah. degree. It creates um, an, an environment within which people operate, shop, mm. Um, mm. and it basically designs the mm. uh, the environment in a way that it presents mm. options to you. So the, the concept of freedom of choice, yeah. now whether that's in the supermarket or anywhere outside, I think to mm. a certain degree, you know, there, there's definitely an argument about this is that there is no freedom of choice. There is only choice between options which are presented to you. Mm, that's right, exactly. So this is where behavioral economics becomes important, right? Because mm. you can pretty much control whether people will pick the red one or the blue one, right? <laughs> um, and you can do clever things with pricing and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think and I think semiotics has a lot in common with behavioral economics in that regard. Yeah. I think what semiotics will additionally do that, that behavioral economics doesn't include within its remit is that it, is that it will offer this kind of um, vantage point from the ceiling. Yeah. where we observe that there's actually no scope from the supermarket. And I would even add, you know, next time you're in a supermarket and you're kind of feeling, you're kind of feeling conscious of that, when you step outside, you still haven't escaped. You know, you step outside of that supermarket into something else, into some other cultural product like London or Surrey, where I was a bit earlier, or or wherever it may be. And when you go to work, let's say you've, you, you've been in the supermarket on your lunch break and you walk down the street in London and return to your office and go back to work, that workplace too yeah. is, a, is a product and a manifestation of culture. So organisational culture is something people talk about a lot, isn't it? And sometimes it's a bit nebulous and we wonder what it means. But for me as a semiologist, culture is manifested in a very extremely tangible way. It's things you can actually point at, you know, it's what the floor looks like and, you know, how, it, how the place is decorated and what sort of chairs people are sitting on and 
what's the common consensus around what you do after after you know at lunchtime and after work and what people are wearing and whether or not people shout and raise their voices all of that type of stuff it's for me culture is something very tangible and you can easily point at it and it's very empirical yeah i think it's really interesting because <clears throat> i always sort of stipulate the difference between you know there's a tangible side to culture and there's the intangible side mm. and you know things like somebody comes back from doing the shopping at lunchtime and they've got a bag you know they've been given a bag and i don't know mm. it's got the name of the uh of the retail outlet they've been to mm. that just acts as a trigger for you especially if they come back and they brought the lunch back and you're not really sure about what you're going to have for lunch somebody mm. comes into the office with bag with company x on it and you're like oh yeah okay and it, it just mm. makes it acts as a trigger and you know these organizations specifically do those bags because they want to trigger in other people yeah, that's it, right. it's about raising awareness about the brand but it's actually about triggering people that have have been have enjoyed the experience of buying their product their the mm. lunch for that particular company and it's just a trigger to remind them oh it's 12 o'clock somebody's could just come back in the office with their lunch oh oh yeah that's right i'll, I'll, yeah, that's I'll go right. to company x but also like entire you know organizational cultures will spring up around things like approval or disapproval of different products so i was i was chatting with a consumer just recently and she is a social worker and she's in many respects what you would think a social worker would be like you know she's jolly nice lady and she wears sort of cardigans and cares about young offenders and all that good stuff um but she for whatever reason she loves apple and right. she's got the light she's got the lightest iphone which is a significant wedge of cash you know mm. and she just loves the brand and she's really pleased with her toy you know mm. but when she pulls it out at work just to endure a certain amount of mockery and disapproval from her colleagues because the kind of local culture of her office suggests that, you know, they basically, they, what they're saying to her is, oh, you're just being a mug, aren't you? You know, you do, it's not, you know, you do realise that um, you're just paying over the odds. You could, you know, if you must have a fancy smartphone, you could have a Samsung for half the price and it'd yeah. be a better phone, you know. People who like Apple are just sheep and you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in the culture of her workplace, there's this attitude that, well, we've got a bit more insight than other people and we shouldn't be susceptible to handing over huge sums of money for flashy brands that are all all kind of all form and no content they're all you know what i mean all style mm. and no substance yeah so she, she, she for her you know she's doing do you know she's just trying to enjoy her phone <laughs> yeah. presumably it's up to her what brand of phone she has but there, an organizational culture is manifesting itself in the quite strong reactions that she'll get from her workmates and you know I think that's happening in workplaces all over the country with regard to everything. Yeah. What you you know, what you what you eat, who you socialise with, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on the point of symbols, I mean, you know, my work around well culture, um, mm. symbols play a significant part in the makeup of any given culture. When you think of symbols, um, are these just logos, like a brand identity? I, I, I make it clear, identity, because that's one of the things we're really hot mm. on on this podcast mm. is okay. brand, is, brand is not just the logo. Brand is yeah, sure. a lot more than just the logo. Mm. So is semantics about the logo or, or is it, when you think about imagery, is it, is it more than a logo? Yeah. So I, I think that when people first encounter semiotics, the first thing they learn about is this business about decoding signs and symbols and you can pass on those skills relatively quickly and uh, people think oh this is great you know i can detect the i can see how red and blue are different i understand why coca-cola is red i understand why airline seats are nearly always blue um you know they can do that or they can they can they can pick up things like when you should use a, a, a serif or a sans serif font without much difficulty. Mm -hmm. But really, if you stop there, all you're doing is train spotting, right? Mm -hmm. All you're doing really is just collecting signs and symbols and noting them down in your little little notebook, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so if you really want to get the most out of semiotics, we then need to connect it to something. And right. we need to um, ask um, not only what does this semiotic sign mean, but what does that tell us about the culture that produced that? I'm, I'm in my spare time, I'm learning Mandarin. <laughs> Okay. Because I know, because I might just like to give myself a challenge. You know, I heard it takes about, if you want to become a fluent reader, it can take a Westerner about 10 years. And I thought, yeah, that will that'll give me some of these for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like this early stage of learning Mandarin, okay, which is very fascinating to me because I'm in semiotics. And so all of those Chinese characters are signs and symbols, right? Uh -huh, of course. Uh, so 
on the one hand, I'm learning, I'm picking up the, I'm actually learning to read quite fast because I'm, I, I spend all day looking at signs and symbols. And so the characters are very appealing to me and make a lot of sense to me. Okay. okay. And so that's the kind of bottom up stuff that everybody knows about semiotics. It's like when you look at the Chinese character for tree and go, oh, look at that. It looks like a tree, which it does. Yeah. Which is, which is great. That's the easy part, right? But then at the same time as I'm studying this language, I'm also learning about something about Chinese culture, which is the more interesting top down part of semiotics more difficult part like did you know there's a word in chinese which specifically means um being um rude and insulting to elderly people okay isn't, isn't that fabulous it isn't is. that fabulous like in english we've got lots of words for being rude to mm. somebody but we don't have a word for specifically being rude to the elderly there's Very something about that that just just I find that deeply satisfying and it's, it's the Chinese language is full of that and indeed I just use it as an example because for most of us who are listening to this podcast are English speakers yeah and so Chinese is so um, removed from English that it serves as a useful example but if you can see how the Chinese characters reveal something about not just the mechanics of how language works but also about the culture that produced that language yeah then you can say how exactly the same is true of English and the same is true of any other language in the world. That's uh, that's really, really pretty to put. I mean, you know, culture and my work, you know, language is you know, one of the, it's, it's, it is one of the cornerstones, and it, it, which is why it surprises me that so many organizations will insist upon communicating in, let's say, you know, the official business language for this organization is English. Mm. So all our mm. comms are in English and you've mm. already stripped out one of the key cornerstones of any given not just nation I mean, obviously lots of you know that there'll be chinese speakers all around the world that there'll be mm. you know english is spoken outside of england um mm. so you strip that out straight away and you're right mm. the language is a reflection of values and the thing with with china you know the respect for um mm. for the elders in society is yeah, part exactly. of confucius thing going on there exactly. isn't it? it's just the same japan etc exactly <laughs> exactly so if for us you know sitting here in the uk having this conversation you know we can sit here and go isn't that fascinating you know that, that in china there's a word that specifically means being insulting to elderly people well you know we could you could imagine this conversation taking place in china with one person signed to another did you know in english there's no word for that yeah, I just don't have it. It doesn't exist as a concept. Like there's no, and I really think that says something about us that we don't value elderly people or senior people as they might think of it, or people have achieved some kind of level of wisdom or wisdom. you know experience. We don't value that very much, and we just feel free to you know talk down to people of any level of wisdom and experience in the same way that you might talk down to you know. Yeah, the kid who sits at the next desk or whatever. Or, or is it? Or, 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 you know, it was interesting when I spoke with um, Gerd Jan Hofstede. Or is it a reflection on we just have different values? Yeah, that's exactly what it's about. And so, if you want to change people's behaviour, you need to know what those values are, and you need to know how to activate them. And that's what semiotics is good for. It will give you all kinds of not only insight into what's motivating your target person yeah. but also it will give you some very practical tools for how to address that person and how to create physical environments and things like that which cause them to behave in the way that you want yeah okay do you know i think that's a perfect opportunity for us to bring this chat to and i think we could talk for a lot longer and i suspect that um mm. it would be great to have you back on the show and to build upon that because that's really again it's another chat with somebody that just joins more of those points together you know you're almost like talking about yeah you tick here tick here tick here tick here but actually i think the real art to raising awareness and and, and importantly influencing behavior mm -hmm. is about understanding you can understand all these you know bits pieces like tactical solutions like you were talking there about why red why blue over red all those type of things mm. but actually it's uh, for me i always ask that the five whys the why 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 uh mm -hmm. and and eventually i get to that point where i go that now i'm pretty much at the I understand the principles mm. and that enables you to answer any question. Mm. Um, and, and I think another conversation with you would flesh out even more, but I think it's been really interesting and Good. how it just went off. Sorry, like, you think about brand, but then 
Play into one of my favourite subject matters, which is is, is cultural. Was, was absolutely I awesome. I know, I know, and it, you know, it will, it will. I'm uh, just a warning, listeners. If you're going to get into <laughs> some of your sex, it will take over your life. Nothing will go untouched. You you start out thinking, well, this will be an interesting technique I can use at work. No, <laughs> no. Once it, once you've developed that skill set, something will switch in your brain, and it will never switch off. <laughs> you might start learning Mandarin you, for a start. Yeah, everything around you and everything in your life will suddenly start showing up on your semiotic radar. Yeah. Yeah. You'll come I, home one day and look at the way that you've decorated your home and go, okay, <laughs> I've just realised what this says about me. What it says about <laughs> you. Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah I, I, but that's great. That's the sign of learning new stuff. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, Rachel. And what we will do in the meeting notes, we'll um, put a link to the to the site. And also, um, we'll we'll highlight some of the suggestions that you've made in terms of other places to go and have a look at information yeah. so that so the listeners can go there and have a change of career. And, okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, look, I'd love to have you back on the show at some point once everybody's had enough time to let this all think through. And so without any further ado, look, I'd really like to thank you on behalf of the community uh, for taking the time out. And uh, yeah, it's been an absolute You're... pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Bruce. That was great. Thanks very much indeed. All right, great. Take care. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye. Well, as I do with all the guests that we have on the show, I just absolutely have having that, that chat with Rachel there. Absolutely electric. You know, as she's talking through semiotics and the work that she does with clients and the origins of semiotics, it enables me to sort of join even more dots together across all the research I've done over the past six years. And, you know, it's fascinating to see the similarities between the challenges that her clients face, who are generally business to consumer, smaller number of people, business to business, and then government. And the challenges that we as the information security community face day in, day out when it comes to awareness, behavior and culture. So I really think there are insights there which can be transferred across. And I hope that you found that of interest too. If you found the episode interesting, please, 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 can I ask you to leave a review or a testimonial? You can either do that via iTunes or you can do that on the LinkedIn group that we have for Marmalade Box, Rethinking the Human Factor, or you could drop us an email just so I can share that with the community and especially with the team here who are behind the podcast because everybody likes to know that the work is being appreciated. So if you're enjoying the podcast, please do let us know. Maybe even share it with people in your own network and communities to help spread the work that we're doing here. So how can you stay abreast of the latest podcasts that we're going to be publishing? Simple ways to do that, sign up to the RSS feed, sign up to the newsletter at www.marmaladebox.com or alternatively request to join our LinkedIn group, which is the Marmalade Box Rethinking the Human Factor LinkedIn group. So who do we have next on the show? The usual routine that we have here at the Rethinking the Human Factor podcast is to invite three or four guests on from outside the security industry. And then what we do is we ask one of our listeners to join us on the show and to share the insights that they've learned from the past three or four podcasts. And then we have a discussion around those three or four podcasts. Who will that guest be? Ah, well, that's a little secret, but you will be finding out in the next four weeks. Do remember that if you do sign up to the Marmalade Box newsletter, you will have the opportunity to actually submit a question for me to pose to our hosts on the podcast and to get them to answer that as best they possibly can. I hope that you found this latest podcast interesting. I know that I thoroughly enjoyed it as ever, and I really do hope that you can join us in the next four or five weeks to listen to our latest update and our latest insights around information security, awareness, behavior, and culture. Many thanks. Thank you.